I assure you, you won't follow it directly. I might throw a few kicks in there. And, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to uh, this morning's worship at uh, St. John's United Methodist Church. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Sal. I will be your uh, lay leader uh, this morning. Uh, for those of you uh, coming online, if you make sure you check in on Facebook, if you if if you uh, so wish. Also, uh, if you lift up uh, your prayer request in the comments, and when, uh, we'll try and get to, to them during our prayer request. If you're joining in person, uh, please take a, a moment to fill out uh, our welcome and attendance sheets in your pews, which also has space to lift up a prayer request. There's a spot uh, for your email as well uh, if you'd like to get your, the weekly newsletter of what's going on in the life of uh, St. John. And finally, if you'll take a look at the back of your bulletin, you'll see the announcements of what's going on at, in the life of the church. Uh, we have a lot of good uh, activities and stuff going on, and you, you may be want to be part of it. And now Pastor Matt uh, has a few announcements to lift up. Thank you, Sal. Well, once again, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. If this is your first time here, especially welcome. I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope that you felt welcomed. I have a few announcements today. Um, one of them is that normally at this time I'd say for anyone who would like to take advantage of our nursery care, it's for ages infant through four. That is still true. However, today, Miss Chelsea, our wonderful nursery worker, is out sick in her whole family. So first and foremost, I ask that you lift Chelsea and her family up in prayers. But the announcement part that I want to lift up is that we continue to look for nursery workers. And so I want any assistance. I want anyone who has ideas who might be able to reach out and see if we can get more nursery worker positions. Next, right after worship, we have our fellowship time in the chapel. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have our first Monday of the month communion service at noon in the chapel. And Dick Smith is going to be leading the service. Also, Monday night Bible study, pastor's Bible study. Last week we ended with sort of a question in the air of when we were going to meet, if it was going to be Sunday or Monday. And so we are actually going to be meeting tomorrow night at our normal time. Uh, wonderful, wonderful John Young. Woo! Thank you, John. He's going to be leading our Bible study, and I've looked over his questions, and he's got some good ones for you. So come and, and be a part of that. Um, I want to lift up just a couple of worship service to help us begin the season of Lent. On Ash Wednesday, which is February 22nd, we're going to have a noon service right here in the sanctuary. And then we are going to have an Ash Wednesday pancake supper and Ash Wednesday service. Now you might be used to a Shrove Tuesday. We're going to kind of put that together and begin that tradition. Typically you might see pancakes come up on the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, but we're going to put these two traditions together this year and we're going to break bread together or break pancakes together. And our pancake supper is going to start at 5.30 with our service to follow at 6 p.m. So you can come for pancakes and ashes. I recommend don't put them together. But you can come for the, uh, just, the, just the meal or the meal in the service or if pancakes aren't your thing or you're already eating, just come at 6 for the service. Finally, you see our screen up there? Is there anybody else who's with me that agrees that it's really hard to see? And how many of y'all have felt that way for a while now? Like me? Sure, absolutely. You know, would y'all be up for exploring a different option to be able to see the words better eventually? Okay, all right. I'm, I'm open to suggestions and, and uh, I, I definitely am interested in that and I have some ideas. And so if you have some ideas or a way that we might be able to support this and do this, um, it won't be changed by next weekend, um, but just partner with me in that. Those are all the announcements that I have. And they all speak to wonderful, life-giving things that are going on in the life of the church, either currently 
or upcoming. But that's not worship. So now, what I want us to do, let's turn our attention to worshiping God during our prelude. Let's prepare our hearts to encounter God through our music, through prayers, and through God's word for us today. Will you join with me? If you would please uh, rise if, you can, if you're able to the call to worship. Holy One, as we gather this morning to worship you, may we speak truth. So that our words may give grace to those who hear. May we pray in faith. So that our words may give grace to those who hear. May we sing with joy so that our words may give grace to those who hear. May we listen with open minds and receptive hearts, so that, so that your, your words, words may be may grace, grace to, us to us who hear. hear. Amen. Amen.
we begin our time coming together in prayer. And I ask for different requests in the life of the church, what we have to lift up. I have a couple that I want to lift up. First, as I'd mentioned, uh, Chelsea, our nursery worker, and her family who are homesick this morning. We also lift up Deanne and health concerns. Are there any others that we want to lift up in the body today? Yeah, Alan. Yeah, we lift up prayers for moisture, but also prayers of thanksgiving for the warmer weather. It feels nice. Yeah, Anna. Okay. Okay. We lift up prayers for Anna, for travel mercies to go back east and see family, and we lift up prayers for a wonderful visit. We lift up continued prayers for allergies. Comes the cold, comes the warmth, comes the chamisa. Yeah, and the juniper. Janet. CT. Okay, you said spinal meningitis and acute renal failure. And so with that, we lift up prayers for seven-year-old CT in Fort Worth for his care and comfort and all of those who surround him and doctors and everybody on his care team. Yeah. Any others that we want to lift up this morning? If anybody has a chance to flip over to Facebook... We might be able to see any that are lifted up there. I lift up prayers as we have been for the last couple of weeks for our ongoing legislative session and all of the comings and goings, all of the traveling that goes on and the, impor and the important work that happens within there. Any others? Choir? Then, as our hymn suggests, let us take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen. As always, I like to begin with a moment of just silent prayer, a moment to, to breathe, a moment to listen. So, let us pray. Good morning, wonderful creator. We come before you in worship, in song, and now in prayer, directing our attention and our devotion to you. For whenever we say, take it to the Lord in prayer, or we say, hear our prayer, it is with the trust and the hope that you hear us, that we hear you. In this moment, Lord, for all of the prayer requests that we have said out loud and those that we have let remain in our own hearts. Hear our prayers. Prayers for healing. Prayers for the anxiety that comes around seeing our loved ones suffer. Those who are medically fragile. Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers in our, for our own hearts and for those who find themselves in such vulnerable positions right now. We lift up prayers of thanksgiving, Lord, that we can be your hands and feet in this world, that we can pray to you and with and for each other. All of this made possible by a wonderful and powerful son who guides us, who pushes us, sometimes pulls us, but is always with us. Lord, in our own brokenness, we ask to be mended back together, the very sinews to be put back together. May our suffering cease, Lord, in all the ways that we might suffer, and let us always be ready to give you the glory, to give you the thanksgiving, when we see that we are mended back together so that we may go then and help others be mended back together. All of this in a prayer that your son taught the disciples 
a prayer that we can pray and live out all day, every day. A prayer that some would say, well, I have to. But we are your people who say, we get to pray. And remember that you are indeed our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As Sal comes up to read the, our first scripture reading, uh, we continue our series on forgiveness. And we've been on a journey. We've been on a journey through Genesis with Joseph and his brothers looking at the finer points of, you know, what I've come to know as a process of forgiveness, where so often in our society we think of uh, forgiveness as this event in time. And so, you know, maybe to the cheers of some people, whether out loud or in their hearts, we are now in the New Testament. And I said, you know, uh, I was giving examples through Joseph of this is what not to do. And so we jump into the words of Jesus today, and we're going to take some scripture together as found in Matthew 18, and this is where we're going to be for the next two weeks. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, The first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Matthew 18, verses 21 and 22. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord... If my brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. Okay. At this time, if we uh, prepare for uh, the offering, if you would please rise for the offering, uh, offertory prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings you bestow upon us and to St. John's United Methodist Church. May we give with gladness and sincerity And please bless those tithe and offerings that we will receive this morning. In the gracious name of your your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.
please stand and sing Praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> What we're going to hear today, we'll end with, uh, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, as we were uh, doing the literal translation. And by the way, once again, thank you, John. I'm lifting you up on all kinds of ways this morning. I, <laughs> John continually seeks recognition. No, 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 absolutely not. No, uh, John is the one who gets our lyrics together uh, for the choir. So thank you so much for doing that, John. And as he pointed out, uh, the literal translation of the English that we hear is not necessarily, it's about getting together, but the, the tone of it carries more when two or three are put together. And I think that's interesting for our scripture. Listen to this. I'm going to keep reading on right after, you know, not seven times, but 77 times, or seven times 77, or seven times 70. We hear this, or before this. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are, are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Let such a one, and if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one to be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if, you, if two of you agree on anything on earth that you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered, or put, in my name, I am there among them. This too is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say together, thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. Will you pray with me one more time? God, as always, I thank you for your life-giving word. May the word that we hear today, may it be with new ears. May we see it with new eyes. Passages like these often come loaded. And so, Lord, let us hear your word and your teaching for us today. Help us continue on this journey in thinking about what forgiveness is, what it's not, and how to practice forgiveness as one of your followers. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be worthy in your sight, Lord. Help me be careful to give you the glory. Amen. Today's scripture readings are a mixed bag. Where we've been studying scripture to tease out specific steps in a process of forgiveness, I want to look at forgiveness in a general way also today. The nature of forgiveness overall and see Jesus' perspective. And the verses that we use today, how many of those are familiar to y'all? How many of those are loaded for y'all? Right, yeah, I, we, we've heard these in different contexts. Maybe you've heard sermons in the past about them. Maybe you've heard studies about them. Maybe you've heard them in, in bad contexts. Well, we're going to be teasing some of that out today. And so that's what these, two next, these next two weeks are about. We'll finish our series next week. Today the passage begins with how to address sin in another. So in our process, it would be what we might have been calling the, the encountering part, where we encounter the offender or the offended. 
And then there's the response that Jesus gives, that on the surface, like we heard in our first scripture reading, that's where we ended. It can be hard to swallow, can it? But it's an exaggeration and, and meant to be that way. It's to capture the essence of forgiveness as reflected by God's work and the forgiveness of us and, and for us. Next week, we'll see an answer to Peter's question taken to the extreme in the parable of what's been called the unforgiving servant or unforgiving slave. Now, first, let's work our way backward a little. Like I said, mixed bag, but we're going we're gonna to get there, I promise. I want to start with the final verse and then back up for there, from there. We see where two or three are gathered in my name, used in all kinds of ways as a, as a standalone scripture. And it sounds nice, right? It sounds comforting. It ends up on greeting cards a lot, right? But in the context of what we've just read, it really means where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. And it's typically in the midst of conflict and strife in the life of the church and my followers. And you better be really careful with the conclusions that you draw. Because in my name, you take on great responsibility in how you treat people. But that just doesn't fit in a greeting card all that well, right? <laughs> I mean, what kind of greeting card is that? I was thinking this week, you know, like you're walking through the Hallmark store, looking through the different sections and topics, and you come across... For when you want to give someone a dire warning about pointing out and forgiving others of their sin, and hopefully they're not resistant to it because there are consequences for unrepentant sin section. <laughs> I have not come across that section in the Hallmark store. But that's our context for scripture today. Sin in others, how to approach, and the responsibility that comes with it in approaching it. Jesus is speaking these words as a warning, as a caution. And we see that, it, that, that in, the, in the teaching that whatever they bind on earth is bound and whatever they loose on earth is loosed. Think of binding as forbidding and loosing as permitting. That's how it's meant this way. He's pointing out that they, the church, we, are representatives of Christ, of God on earth. The church has been given authority on earth and in heaven to represent God. It's no small responsibility at given either. Basically, these verses are meant to put the church in check, that they must take great care in who they are and the decisions they make and any authority and power that they might feel that they have. So now let's look at the passage in order, verses 15 through 17. In this instance, taking into consideration that Christ is in the midst of two or three and where two or three are gathered and they have great responsibility in representing Christ. These verses are about the decisions and actions taken around someone who sins. It's about how to respond individually and also as a church. These words have been famously used and I think sometimes abused, misused, and targeting people in the church, even when it's followed in the order that Jesus' teaching suggests, it comes down to where our heart is and what our motivations are. Some will look at these passages as a guide for conviction and condemnation. Others will look at these passages as a guide for reconciliation and redemption. Both directions need to have boundaries, right? Too far one way or another, and the focus of Christ and the church is lost. This whole teaching is about reconciling someone, saving someone from sin. And that forgiveness can happen. That forgiveness should be pursued. And it's when someone is caught in a sin. There's a process that's supposed to be done in a way that reflects the grace and the love of God. A person who is sinned against is charged with calling it out to the sinner in these verses. The one who is been sinned against takes the initiative to reconcile. And for what purpose? Well, to help them be saved from sin. That phrase that, that we heard in 15 and 16, you know, if, if you're successful in this, you have regained that one, or you have won them back. It's a very different model that, than, let's say, something of confronting someone about their sin in the form of a gotcha moment, a putting them in their place moment. The gotcha moment is more of a model of breaking someone down and exercising the human authority to show a superiority of some kind. It's not what we're getting at here. Our passage doesn't say that you'll get along with that person ever again. 
but it wins them back from their sin. It comes down to seeing one suffering in sin, and it has caused you to suffer as well in some way. And then it's coming back to a place of compassion with the goal to win that person back. <laughs> I get it. It can be so difficult to see someone who has sinned against you as one who is also suffering. And so that other key word is one used for reprove. How we encounter these other people. The word reprove. And here it means to teach, to warn, to correct, to, to call out. Maybe Maybe even find a moment of conviction. But not conviction in a judgmental sense of passing judgment on this whole person and their entire identity. And anger is not a part of it. There may be anger and hurt involved, but it's getting to a point where you've been able to set it aside, even if for a moment, to point out and reprove someone in their fault and their sin. That's where the first process, the, the first part of our process of forgiveness is crucial that we've talked about. It's, it's about naming. It's about understanding the hurt and then feeling and knowing and deciding what to do with that hurt in a healthy and wholesome way. This is a crucial point because quite often I think we, we come into a confrontation or encounter loaded with emotion, Right? People will pick up on the emotion when, they, when we have that encounter. And they'll respond to that emotion more or instead of what caused the hurt or sin in the first place. And then I think you can relate. It becomes a lot more complicated and a lot more to clean up, right? Well, the same thing goes for when we respond only to someone's defensiveness or anger. And it sidetracks the whole reason for being there. If the single encounter isn't successful that you have with someone in sin... You take a couple of folks with you, right? Not to build your case uh, against them and gang up on them once you've been unsuccessful in the first encounter. No, you take them as witnesses and support. And that support is to once again overcome the sin and be reconciled. There's a long precedence of, of having witnesses in the Old Testament to settle matters. And if that doesn't work, and you haven't gained them back, won them back, and is brought before the entire community of faith. i got to say, David uh, lifted up a great point in our Bible study on Monday. Uh, when we think about taking it before the entire community, this whole community back then would have probably been a lot smaller than how we might think of it today. Groups, you know, as, as David mentioned, you know, maybe in the 40 range or the 60 range, and not necessarily the 900 range across multiple services on a worship service Sunday, right? But smaller. We're not talking about standing in front of 200 people, but a much smaller group, and many, many of them may be family. But regardless, it's going before or being brought before a group of people, and the goal is still to reconcile. And if that doesn't work, then we get the famous line, right? Treat such a one as a tax collector or a Gentile. And this often gets interpreted as you cast them out, they are condemned, and there's no coming back from that. I mean, maybe unless they come groveling back to the group. Maybe. And this is what it, this is what makes it look like and what we've been conditioned to believe, I think, and heard this text in the process of excommunication or something. I've heard this being played out in the past in very unhealthy power trips by a person or a small group of people or entire congregations. Has anyone ever heard that and used this together? Yeah. That we have any hands in the air. It just, it's affirmation and confirmation, once again, that we have work to do with God's word. First, there's nothing in here about some sort of final condemnation, that the process stops after this and you cast that person out of your life completely. And from a logical standpoint, I can, I can see where that conclusion is drawn. If you're a Jewish believer at the time, you didn't have much to do with Gentiles and tax collectors in practice. You didn't have much communication. You wouldn't want to be seen in that light as having much communication and interaction. But if you're a follower of Jesus, <laughs> then tax collectors and Gentiles are your ministry. They're your mission. It, it, that's your bread and butter of growing the kingdom of God, right? Jesus continually sought out those who were undermined, marginalized, the outcasted, even if they appeared to be well off on the surface. 
Jesus makes it a large part of his mission in reaching out to those who don't know him or maybe don't want to know him or are challenged by him. That's his mission. So I ask this morning, who are the Gentiles and tax collectors in your life right now? The sinners that may or may not reflect your own sins as a follower of Christ that you need to be held accountable of and reproved of. Who are the people who have wronged you in life and your initial inclination is to respond in kind or maybe even one-up them to put them in their place rather than seeking true reconciliation with a sister or brother in Christ? No, we're not called to abandon people completely in their sin or add on to it in some cases. There needs to be accountability and reproving for all of us. But outright abandonment as the forgiven so that then we don't have the opportunity to see God's forgiveness in others in action? I don't see that here at all. And it certainly doesn't line up with Jesus' take on forgiveness. What it really is is a process of reconciliation among believers. And that process is easy sometimes. It's difficult sometimes. It's short sometimes. It's a long process sometimes. Yes, there is a time when the, when the church has to protect itself as much as it cares for and it protects others. There are times when the community of believers say, we cannot have that in our community of faith. It is outside of being followers of Christ and gaining brothers and sisters and including them in the salvation that is offered to all. I appreciate the thoughts of Dr. Warren Carter on this point as a reminder. He writes, the generous offering of forgiveness does not negate the seriousness of sin or the community's responsibility to reprove the offender, even to the point of recognizing that she or he has become maybe an outsider of the community. We have foundational truths about God, about who Jesus was, is, and will be, and we, we must have, figure out how to live those truths out in real time as ages and generations change. But one of those foundational truths is forgiving as we have been forgiven and celebrating when the lost sheep has been returned and reconciled, which, by the way, is the story that comes right before our reading today and sets up these verses. We can look at what we've read today as some steps to find and regain a lost sheep, not make our very dead-level best efforts to make sure that they stay lost. So this brings us back to the beginning, the first passage, which is really the end of the passage for today. Got it? We went backward so that we might understand verses 20 and 21 a little bit better. How many times do we seek out the lost sheep and seek to regain them, win them back from being lost? That's where we get Peter's question, and I hear sarcasm here. All right, Jesus. That's all well and good, I suppose. But Lord, if a brother or sister sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? The number seven is symbolic of divine perfection. Peter's asking about the links that we should go to to forgive, to make it complete, make it divine. And Jesus has an answer. And depending on your translation, it's 77 times or 70 times 7. A symbolic question is asked, and a symbolic answer is given. And Jesus, in this answer, he answers with great exaggeration to show that the links of God's grace and forgiveness are virtually boundless, and we should seek to live in the same way, no matter what the process of forgiveness is, even though it's tough. Forgiveness is for us, and it's for the sinners who can accept and receive forgiveness. It's so that we may be made whole again, and hopefully another can be made whole again. I've talked about how forgiveness can be a one-sided process to wholeness, and, and these passages today are no exception. If one is gained back after sinning against you, you have to keep pursuing forgiveness on your side. If it's rejected, you keep working at it so that you may be cleansed and healed of the wrongs done against you so that you yourself do not let that hurt color all of the other interactions in, in life that are outside of the grace and forgiveness shown to you by God and others. Forgiving others, being forgiven, seeking God for forgiveness, it takes work, doesn't it? 
To find complete forgiveness, it takes work on your part, on their part, on God's part. And the end result is being won back for Christ. Whether it's you who is won back or if you're the person won back or the other person is won back or all parties involved, that's the goal of forgiveness, of reconciliation, to be won back. It's a never-ending process from when we take our first breath to our last. It takes practicing true forgiveness of others and yourself in the small instances and big instances of hurt alike. It is achievable. And Jesus says, how many? If we've had examples of what not to do, Jesus is saying, here's how many times you forgive. Here's how many times you go through that process if you truly are one of mine. And it's messy. And we'll learn next week about how messy that can be. Next week, we're going to look at forgiving from your heart, which means genuine forgiveness. If you want to read ahead, our story comes right after our passage today. It's the parable, the story of what's called the unforgiving slave or unforgiving service. We're going to end our series looking at the radical links of forgiveness but also the radical misery of being unforgiving and how much damage that can do to us as long as we hang on to our unforgiveness and bitterness. Christ our Lord wants you to be made whole in all the ways that you might feel that you are broken, in all the ways that you have been broken. Christ our Lord wants others to be made whole those people that perhaps you have caused brokenness in. To live by his teachings. Christ wants us to be his representatives as the church. To show a broken world the, the marvelous, amazing grace that Christ offers through God in this world. Yeah, putting in the work for it can be so difficult, so messy, it's so rewarding. Take comfort that you are not alone in this process of, uh, of ministry, including a process of forgiveness. Christ is with you, guiding you, and so are his faithful. As we move into a time of communion today, remember the links that Christ went to in, in wanting to show his solidarity with you and his work for you. Christ went to the ultimate links for forgiveness for those who would accept it and those who would not. That's why we invite everyone to this table in this community of faith. We invite everyone to this table to remember or discover the links that Christ went to in his brokenness, in his victory over sin and death. That's why we do what we do in communion. It's to commune with God and with each other, to break bread together, to be a part of the brokenness to be a part of the forgiveness, to be part of the triumph through Christ. So come to this table when, you, when it's time. Stay at the altar. Pray. Pray at the altar for whatever current process of forgiveness you find yourself in, no matter what it is. If you've had interactions with anybody over the last week, there's a chance that there might be conflict. There's a chance that people have said things to you or you've said things to them or things that go back 25 years that you're still hanging on to. Well, this is an opportunity to come and dig into that a little bit. Come to the table. Come to the altar. Stay and pray. Be reminded that you are not alone that you have a friend in Jesus that you can join with in prayer, that you can trust Jesus. I think of that story of that night when Jesus gathered the disciples and he passed around the hand sanitizer. <laughs> and at some level... They break bread. They're looking at the Passover. It's the time of the Passover feast. 
The disciples, I'm sure, are saying, yeah, let's get our Passover on, you know. And then Jesus, in so many words, after washing the disciples' feet and humbling them, and humbling himself yet again, asks if they trust him. I'm sure they said, yeah, in some way. And he said, well, do you see this? This is my body, and it's broken for you. Everything that, that we've had leading up and preparing us for Passover, what I'm doing here tonight, in some ways, maybe we'd say it in more common terms, I'm about to revolutionize your life. But it changed for them. Because he said, what you have known and what you have seen in me all this time that you've been with me, this is actually my body and it's broken for you. He gave thanks to his Father in heaven. And then similarly, he took the cup and he gave thanks to his Father in heaven. And he said, do you see this? This is my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins for the sins of many, for the sins of all. And in this, there is a brand new covenant, a brand new promise, a brand new contract in some ways, if we use that word covenant. That what we do here tonight will change you, no matter what happens to me over the next couple of days, which we would eventually call Good Friday and Holy Saturday and Easter Sunday. And no matter what, you can do this in remembrance of me. And I'm sure that the disciples were equal mix of confused, maybe anxious, but also faithful. And they obviously said in some way, shape, or form, okay, we'll do this in remembrance of you as often as we gather together. And so here we are this morning, gathering as disciples, as sinners, as those reconciled, as those broken, as those put back together, as those in various stages of what I've just illustrated. If I were to ask how many of y'all are in one of those stages right now, every hand should shoot in the air. And that's promising and hopeful because it binds us together as we are bound together in Christ. So in a minute, you'll be asked to come forward to the table We'll have our ushers on either side. You'll receive a piece of bread. And you'll dip it in the cup. And you'll hear, this is the body of Christ broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me or some variation. And you'll hear, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Do this in remembrance of him. But make no mistake, as we say in the United Methodist Church, this is an open table. It's not a St. John's table it's not a United Methodist table. It is the Lord's table. And we wholeheartedly believe that we are not gatekeepers to the word and gatekeepers to the table. Maybe it's a coming up for you of remembrance. Maybe it's one of brand new discovery. But either way, the choice is yours. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, as you have guided us in worship today, as you have filled our lungs with breath to sing praises of God the Father, God our Creator, God our Redeemer, God our Sustainer, as you have opened our ears to your word, as you have opened our eyes as much as you have opened our hearts, not only to your word, but the grace that we can receive through it and the grace that we can show together. Now we ask, Lord, Holy Spirit, Come upon these simple gifts of bread and fruit of the cup and make them be, in fact, the body and the blood of Christ broken and shed for us. May we do this in remembrance, in discovery, in forgiveness. Amen. Would those who are serving communion please come forward at this time? Also, if you would like to remain seated, we would be happy to come and serve you where you are at. When the time comes, just raise your hand in the air and we'll come to you.
I would invite you all as well, like Jesus told the disciples, to get some hand sanitizer. You know, I'm also, we normally have our individually wrapped cups. If you would prefer to take communion by one of our individually wrapped cups with the wafers in the top, they're going to be right here on the table, and I'm going to go get them real quick. But then I also invite everybody, if you want to take communion with the bread and the cup here, you know, grab a couple of the communion cups, put them in your pocket. And I want you to find a couple people to go share communion with and take communion with, okay? stand further out here. Lynn, why don't you stand right there, Frank? On the other side of Wayne. Here we go. Here we go. Sisters and brothers in Christ, sisters and brothers of this world, the table is now ready. You're welcome to come up the side aisles, stay and pray, and then return to your seat through the middle. The table is ready. Will you come? like to be served where you're seated, will you please raise your hand?
you know, I had to chuckle during communion. I grabbed out a couple of handfuls and there are only just four left. It's the first time since we started doing this that I got nervous during communion that we were going to run out and I'd have to go back for more. What a wonderful thing to be nervous about, amen? Thank you and take communion with you. And then so I'll also lift up. There's four left. Let us pray. God, in this time of breaking bread together, a great thanksgiving for all that you have been for us, all that you currently are for us, and all that you will be for us. We wrap that all together and seek your guidance and strength so that in our own brokenness, we may be mended back together so that we can purposefully, caringly, grace-filled, seek out the brokenness of others in your name. So thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to break bread together and remember you. Amen. Let's rise as we are able, or as you're comfortable, and let's sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. I think it's a good way. this morning. And then I invite you to sit down where you're at and reflect during our time of postlude. I always challenge our congregation and this congregation to 
Ponder how you're going to walk out of here different from how you came in this week. So receive this benediction. And to take him at his word. How much did Peter struggle with that? Well, let us be the people that go forth from this place with the grace and the Spirit of God leading us boldly into this world to go and be the hands and feet, the life-giving hands and feet of Christ in our own processes of forgiveness and to trust Jesus and take him at his word that forgiveness is applicable and it's attainable. Go forth in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated.